Hey guys, KYT here with another video due to the popularity of the last one and inspired me to go, let's, let's do a whole series. Let's follow me from current me to being a house owner for the first time. In this video, I'm going to talk about how I tackled the rent versus buying decision. Of course, I'm fully prepared for the fact that many people have very strong opinions on this topic and just want to shout their opinion in my comment section, just like my XQT versus VFB video. People just don't really want to add to the discussion. They just want to shout out their position VFB all day. The main reasons were non-financial. My wife, number one, had wanted a house for so long. And number two, I think we have outgrown the current place we are in. I'm looking for a forever home for my kid to be able to have a bigger space to play in. And we're starting to get into play dates, having her meet with different uh, kids of the similar age and having a bigger area for both of them to be able to play around and run around is more optimal. And uh, we're getting to the point where she is going to enter pre kindergarten soon. So having a set place has some non financial value to me. And speaking of forever home, I had the pleasure of being able to talk with Ben Felis in private on housing a number of times, and his approach remains the same. He thinks one of the more optimal approaches is to rent until you're able to buy a forever home due to the high transaction costs versus the, this concept of starting with a starter and then slowly moving up into your dream home. He'd rather rent all the way through uh, that that process, that whole starter and multiple home process, he'd rather just rent the whole way. And that way you just have to pay the transaction costs once you get into your forever home. That's the approach I've chosen to do, but that doesn't mean I'm close-minded to eventually upgrading as well. I'm not closing the doors on that, but that's just the general approach that I'm taking. Now let's get down to rent versus buy. I honestly have to say 95 to 99% of people I've talked to in my inner surroundings, whether it be my in-laws, my relatives, some of my close friends, they really, 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 really think renting is bad. I've heard this so many times, rent is an unrecoverable cost and you're just making the landlords richer. First of all, it really doesn't matter that the landlords are getting that money. I think that's really used to frame rent in a bad way for no reason, because all that matters is that your net worth, your whole net worth, what happens when you're renting and what happens to that when you're buying. And sure, rent is unrecoverable, but by emphasizing that point and not how your net worth, your entire net worth is affected in either scenario, it seems to be ignoring unrecoverable costs on the owning a home side. But thankfully, there's excellent articles like this one on PWL Capital that talks about a homeowner's actual unrecoverable costs. One, property taxes, two, maintenance costs, and three, cost capital, mortgage interest, plus opportunity costs. Which leads to the 5% rule, but remember the 5% rule is meant to be an oversimplified shortcut, and so don't judge it as some comprehensive solution of any kind. And the 5% rules arrived at using reasonable percentages, estimates for these three components. I'll provide a link to this article in the description below, but basically uses 1% of the property's value as its estimate for property taxes, 1% for maintenance costs, and 3% for cost of capital, all three considered to be within reasonable ranges, but not meant to be ultra precise either. You can even see this section at the end, the inevitable caveat. So don't view the formula as this end all be all, but again, it's a shortcut. So here I'm gonna read this section here, take the value of the home you're considering, multiply it by 5% and divide it by 12 months. If you can rent for less than that, renting may be a sensible financial decision. For example, you could estimate about 2,500 dollars in annual unrecoverable costs for a $500,000 home or $2,083 per month. It goes the other way too. If you find a rental you love for $3,000 per month, you can take $3,000, multiply by 12 months and divide by 5%. The result in this case is $720,000. So in terms of unrecoverable costs, $3,000 per month in rent is roughly financially equivalent to owning a $720,000 home. Thankfully on Centrus, you can just flip this for sale or for rent to really look and do a comparison. Now I'm not going to use this formula to decide whether to buy or rent. My wife was never going to accept us renting a big home. It's just not going to happen. But what this rule allows me to see is that I'm not necessarily losing out against someone who buys a home in terms of net worth, because it comes down to unrecoverable costs and what you do with the actual money. Right, They have their down payment, they have their mortgage invested in the home. 
I have mine in XEQT. It's not necessarily true that they're going to come out way ahead compared to me. And while understand real estate is easier to understand, especially for my in-laws and probably my parents, and it's done really well, we can check out something like this RBC article, very recent, 2021, that compares the Canadian stock market with real estate from different popular cities. And it's based on an initial $300,000 investment with no leverage over the last 25 years. And it's pretty comparable with the S&P TSX composite total return index coming up on top with 8%. And of course, this is XEQT without taking into account dividends has been up 46.14% since inception, which is in 2019. So a huge run up as well. And, and that's why I feel a lot of people have a tunnel vision view about renting. It's not that simple. I did see an interesting question on Facebook in this Facebook group I'm in. I'm going to summarize their general feeling. They were talking about why does it feel like real estate people have done a whole lot better? And, and that is a good question. And that's because in real estate, you're amplifying your gains and losses. You're essentially investing with leverage. For example, if you have a 20% down payment, that the most common percentage, you are exposed to the gains and losses of the entire worth of that property. That means 100K in a property has higher upside than 100K in stocks. But the market doesn't always go up. So let's temper those real estate expectations a little. This place that I've seen listed at 725,000 roughly has been on the market for roughly a year now. I've even emailed the realtor recently if this house is still available. It has no offers on it. So conceivably, it's worth quite a bit less than this, maybe under 700. And I found this YouTube video advertising it when it was close to $800,000. So it's possible with interest rates, with the market, things can affect your home that you bought in a, in a negative way. It can go down sometimes. Lastly, I want to add more nuance to another argument from the buying side, which is it helps diversify your portfolio. Yes, it does add an extra asset class. You now not only own stocks, you are now exposed to real estate. The problem with that is that most of us as far as I know, with these crazy house prices, is that most of us would have to devote most of our net worth into that home. And that is a problem. We are now heavily exposed to this house that we bought in a specific location. Its performance is going to greatly impact our net worth in the future. So that is not great diversification, in my opinion. And it's important to point out that diversification benefits can often be overstated if both assets move in the same direction anyways, which is why correlation is such an important word when it comes to analyzing the benefits of holding different assets. So why does it seem like I'm defending renting a lot? Well, it's because most people I talk to vilify it to a certain degree that I just don't think makes any sense, respectfully. But of course, I am ultimately looking into buying, like I said, because of the non-financial benefits at the beginning of this video. And I think the 5% rule could be a good tool for a lot of you looking at trying to figure out when you should be making that leap. There is one huge benefit to buying, which is that it caps your housing price concerns. What I mean by that is that while Bitcoin can go astronomically high and you get FOMO, it going high and you not owning it will not affect you that greatly because it's not essential. But it is possible that if rent housing keeps going up like crazy, you might be seriously priced out. And with that, I'll see you in the next one. And, and hopefully by the next video, I'll be a house owner. And we're going to talk about inspection, mortgages, and things like that more specifically. So see you in the next one.